Hearthstone Global Games is an epic country versus country tournament where teams of four card slingers each clash for national pride. But in the end, the UK always wins. Wait, everybody knows it's Germany always wins. Um, aren't you Polish? Is winning or that matters? It's all about fun and getting along with your teammates. That's easy when their skills are legendary. Or in this case, you have an ace player who will never let you down. So we're going to see the same old archetypes then? No. Every team needs to bring all nine classes. So we're going to see Hunter? <sighs> I wonder. So let's recap. It's four regions, 48 countries. But, but, only one winner. Get ready for the Harson Global Games. Hello and welcome to the most casually dressed Hearthstone Global Game stream that you've ever seen and will ever see. Do you want to, do you want to explain that one, Rob? Yeah, so uh, I was putting on my dress shirt backstage and it, uh, it just ripped right here because I'm very muscular. Uh, you may not know that when you look at me, but... Uh, <laughs> so. Well, Kanye would decide to be a bro and just go ahead and wear uh, casual shirts. But I do want to point out there's precedence for this. The 2015 World Championship. Go look it up. T-shirts and blazers. So this is totally harsh on esports. But don't go look it up yet. As first, we've got five incredible series. Yeah, please stay with us. Today. Please stay. Don't go anywhere. Don't even get a drink. Wait, we want you here. Let's quickly take a look at the Hearthstone Global Games format before we get into it, though. Stage one, long gone now. It was a 10-week round robin. We cut the amount of teams in the tournament in half with Stage 1, and we've just started Stage 2. We're in the first week right now. Yeah, Stage 2, a uh, little bit shorter than Stage 1. We have three bit. weeks here. Well, three, yeah, that's fair. It went from 10 weeks to three uh, with six groups of four teams. So we saw kind of the opening shots yesterday. We're going to continue to see some more. The name of the game here is that these players and these teams all want to get to Stage 3, though. The 16-team single elimination with the top four advancing to a live LAN Finals later this year. Yeah, every single win in Stage 2 of the tournament counts because they only play, what, three games, yep. I think? So um, every single one does count. You need two wins to guaranteed get through, I think. Right. And even on one win, like so, some of the teams will get through based on that. The, uh, the top two teams in each group, which only has four teams in, definitely get through. And then the third best team in some of the groups will get through. Yeah, there's four spots there for those teams. Yeah. But yeah, we, we talked to some of the teams and they were you know saying like, oh, in the beginning of stage one, we didn't necessarily take it as seriously, but uh, no margin for error here in stage two. But some of the teams that, that just won the game yesterday, for example, there was a 3-0. and That team might just be able to claw their way into the, the finals, or the yeah. top 16 rather, just off the back of that 1-3-0. The tiebreakers are going to be really important here. Yeah, groups also very important. Let's go ahead and take a look at those. We see here Group A, Malaysia and Singapore squared off yesterday. Malaysia able to take that win in five. China and Norway also in the group, though, so very exciting. Yeah, they're going to be following up tomorrow. Group B... Uh, no games played in Group B yet, but that's going to change a little bit later today as I think all four of these teams are playing. Yep, we will be seeing all of them today. Group C, though, Argentina, Netherlands, Philippines, South Korea. Netherlands versus the Philippines actually going to start out our day. Yeah, really looking forward to that one. Group D, New Zealand and Hungary played yesterday. There's the 3 0 I was just referring to. Yeah, certainly a pretty quick series, that one there. Go ahead and take a look at Group E, though. Ukraine, Greece, Peru, Austria. This is a Really stacked team, stacked group. Really excited to see what uh, ends up coming out of it. Yeah, Ukraine, as you would expect, got a pretty strong start there. But finally, Group F, Italy, my team there sitting on top. But Canada and Mexico are going to be playing today. Yeah, going to be really exciting. Uh, Canada and Mexico both representing the Americas, respectively. So uh, they, they've actually had some words about each other. Going to be an exciting one. Let's take a look at the games that we have got coming up today. So we can make that completely clear. You saw it a moment ago. You can see it again now. Starting off the day with Netherlands versus Philippines. Then Czech Republic versus Israel. Greece versus Peru. Belgium versus the United States. And Canada versus Mexico. Rob, which game are you looking forward to the most today? Uh, it's tempting for me to just go ahead and say United States versus Belgium, but I'm actually really looking forward to Canada versus Mexico. Uh, Canada was the team I, I picked to win the whole thing. Mexico, however, has come out extremely strong. They lost in pretty much stage one in the first series they played. And they went on a 4-0 winning streak and actually won their group over wow. Taiwan, so... Mexico uh, looking really sharp. I've got to say, I think I'm looking forward to the first game the most today. Yeah. Uh, I've, got, I've got to, you know, get opposite to you so that everyone has a reason to stick around all day. Netherlands versus Philippines. Netherlands is one of my favorite teams. It's one of, I'm sure, a lot of people's favorite yeah. teams. Um, and Philippines is one of Lorinda's teams, one of Lorinda's picks. He's got two picks. He's a, he's a cheat. But uh, Philippines is one of them. So uh, I'd like to see uh, Netherlands win just, just because 
I like to see the other casters' picks losing out, so I feel better about myself. All right, let's go ahead and take a look at the roster. The Netherlands uh, represented, this is a roster most people should be familiar with, Tice, Tyler, Theo, and Mitsuhide. The Philippines represented by Waning Moon, Karakute, Chalk, and Staz. So a lot of history here from the Hearthstone Championship Tour between these two teams. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, Tice, you know, obviously we've seen a couple times now in the Hearthstone World Championship at Staz. Back in right. the day, Staz uh, from the Philippines, he's well known for his uh, his four forays into competitive Hearthstone at the championship tour level. Both incredibly competitive teams. Obviously, they're here in stage two of the tournament. Uh, and Netherlands is the name is the team name that that shouts out to everyone. I mentioned it a moment ago. You said everyone watching should probably know who these guys are. Tice, one of the biggest Hearthstone streamers, one of the most successful players, and one of the players I think who's earned the most money playing the game. Tyler, another one of the most successful Hearthstone streamers. If you've never seen his stream, just go and look at Twitch anytime. Probably not now because he's going to be playing here, but anytime. You live, said anytime. He's live almost 24 hours, seven days a week. Sure. Yeah, uh, they're definitely a tales of two or tale of two different teams here. Uh, the Netherlands, in terms of match score, actually emerging from stage one with the best match score overall. I think they ended up with a 72% win rate wow. overall. Yeah, four and one. The Philippines actually emerged uh, with a, a game record score of two three, and they had a 10 and 10 match score. So this is actually the the very highest uh, in terms of win rate versus the team that is tied for the lowest. So definitely coming from different points here, and uh, the confidence levels are also very different. I've spoken to both of the teams well, here. Well, let's take a listen and see. I think we've got an interview with one of the players coming right up. Hi, I'm Tyler, the grinder. I play for Team The Netherlands in Hearthstone Global Games. I used to have a lot more passions before I started doing Hearthstone full-time. I used to work as a fashion photographer. Before that, I used to do breakdancing. I used to work as a breakdance teacher too. But nowadays, people call me Tyler the grinder because apparently I play Hearthstone 23 hours a day and I sleep one hour a day. Which is not true, I play about 15 hours a day and I sleep 8 hours. The other one hour, that's for relaxing. So overall, going into the global games, I felt like the Netherlands is one of the strongest teams in, in the competition. We definitely have the firepower to take it all the way. I'm glad we didn't disappoint and we actually managed to get one of the best scores. Moving forward, we definitely thought that the US would finish first and we would finish second in the group. We ended up sweeping all the other series and US ended up dropping one, so we definitely did not expect it. So the roles in our team, I feel like even though Tice has like the captain role, Tice listens to the input of all of us and whenever he doesn't feel experience about a certain decision or a certain deck, then he will just say, Tyler, you know more about Smork deck, so you make the decision or you make the decision on this deck card. So in a way, we all have uh, something to add. Me and Mitsuhide, we are more of uh, the smart players, we like going face. And then you have Tais and Teo who are definitely leaning more towards the control decks. There are a lot of fans supporting uh, the Netherlands in the global games. Even people that are not from the Netherlands, they have shown their support, even betraying their own countries. I won't name any names, but people have uh, chosen to support me over their own country. So yes, <laughs> for sure, there's definitely a, a whole lot of support. Going in, I didn't expect to feel that pressure, but every time we go into a match, we actually really want to win for our, our country, and when you do win for your country, it feels really good. Tyler, well aware of the fact that people are supporting the Netherlands and abandoning their own countries. And I'm not too surprised. Like, the Netherlands are one of these teams that people will do that for. USA being another one, Canada. These teams that have the big names, there are a lot of Hearthstone fans out there that they don't care about their own countries. They just want to see the big players win. Yeah, the draw of personality is certainly a large one, but we have the matchups in, so we'll go ahead and take a look at those as well as the Hearthstone Global Games format. I'll go ahead and uh, walk us through. Dan, since you said this was not really your area of expertise. Um, <laughs> Go yeah, ahead. So you see uh, four players on each team. They have to bring all nine classes, so that is definitely very unique for competitive Hearthstone at the moment. Uh, the first four players are playing one of two decks, which they go ahead and queue up. Uh, make the choice. The final deck there, you see those final three decks represent the ace match. So the ace match is the decider uh, if the game or the series goes to five games. You see there, uh, players will be forced to pick one of those decks. So yeah, it's, a, it's definitely a very unique format and one we've seen a lot of, a lot of evolution to as the global games have gone on. Now, now, Rob, I don't fully understand the format, but Warlock always appears at the bottom there. Is that is that one of the rules? Or? That's by design. Uh, okay. Yeah. Warlock right now, not really seeing a whole lot of play, obviously. It's finally, after after a, a long streak of just frankly being one of the most powerful classes in Hearthstone, 
uh, kind of taking a back seat now to a lot of the other classes that it used to beat up on. It says a lot about the versatility of the game, I think. Yeah. How, uh, as you said, it used to be one of the strongest classes. Priests used to be one of the weakest classes, and priests actually priests okay now. Warlock, not so much. Um, funnily enough, I got some of the uh, the st statistics from the games yesterday, and uh, some things you may not expect. Yeah, okay, Shaman was the most played deck. Seven out of eight times the yeah. team picked Shaman. Um, Warlock wasn't the most passed up deck, though. That was actually Hunter. I can only put that down to the fact that Warlock was often at the bottom, and we didn't get to the point Doctor, where that was Yeah, Dr. Up. Hippie did play Warlock yesterday, so. Yes. All right, we see here, though, the first decks. Tyler's going to be on that Rogue. We're going to see Waning Moon on the Druid. With Tyler, I really wouldn't be surprised at all to see this be Quest Rogue, but I did talk to Tice a little bit earlier today, and he was telling me that they do like to switch it up and keep it fresh just to make sure they're unpredictable. Uh, they actually, a lot of the time, will not be playing the same classes week to week. Huh. They actually like to switch it up. They, It's, it's really a sign of, of, frankly, I think one of the team's greatest strengths. You know, you mentioned USA and Canada, and uh, certainly powerful teams uh, in a number of respects, but the Netherlands, there's very little ego with these players, right? They they are very much team first, and they kind of defer to each other, and nobody feels like they have to have that final shot calling in the decision-making process. So uh, being flexible, being able to play all nine classes, it's it's a huge strength. And we heard that from, from Tyler just a moment ago in the interview. Like, yeah, okay, Tice is the captain, but he listens to everyone. If, yeah. if it's about Smork, then he would defer to uh, to Tyler or Mitsuhide. Uh, now, in the video, we also saw Tyler playing the quest row. Yeah. Um, turns out he is going to bring it back today. But lining up against the Agro Druid from Waning Moon, it's not going to be so easy for Tyler. Yeah, certainly, Agro Druid is one of the decks that you know really tends to prosper when the quest rogue is all over the ladder. It goes very uh, aggressive. It can go very wide. It has some big threats that are. Uh, you know, just consolidated to one minion, but it's really difficult to deal with. For Tyler, if he thinks this is Aggro Druid, he's really going to want to find Glacial Shard, or if not Glacial Shard, something that allows him the fastest path to completing the quest if he wants to have a shot at winning this. Of course. Yeah, Glacial this... Shard, just such a powerful tool. It, it can even stop Vicious Fledgling in its tracks for, for a couple of turns sometimes. That's going to be one of the cards that Waning Moon wants to pick up to win yeah. this game as quickly as possible. That being said, his starting hand isn't looking so bad itself. He's got one drop, two drop, three drop. He does, although I think there might be a temptation to drop Tar Creeper. Yeah. Tar Creeper is certainly much less powerful on the offensive, and what he's going to be looking for is a really strong start, regardless of whether or not this is Miracle or Quest Rogue. So the mulligans essentially remain the same, remain the same and we see that Tar Creeper just going away. And Savage Roar now in the hand, uh, a powerful tool, maybe not necessarily something he's going to use, say, before turn three or four. But uh, it is good to have. Yeah, this hand just looks a little bit more versatile than the than the one he had before. Savage Roar and Power of the World can both be used in a multitude of different ways, whereas Tar Creeper's just no good against the Quest Rogue specifically. You don't need the defensive tool against this deck. Now, Tyler can have to decide whether he wants to go turn one Firefly, Swash Burglar, or play the Quest. Um, against Aggro Druid, he might be inclined to not play the Quest on turn one. Might also feel like he doesn't necessarily want to play the pirate. Uh, we do see Galaka Crawler in a number of aggro druids, so That's true. if he does play the Swashburglar there, then there's pretty solid chance for a blowout just off the Galaka Crawler coming out. One thing I do find is interesting is Tyler is running Backstab. We have seen Backstab be cut from a lot of quest rogues. It's kind of coming back in style more recently, but for a while people were just kind of abandoning any kind of removal opportunity. Really? The volcano this early? I, I was just That's... smirking as soon as okay. it started happening because I could see the mouse creeping towards the drum in the bottom right corner. Like, is this going to happen? Casual dress, volcanoes going off this. <laughs> this episode of Hearthstone Global Games is delivering, but we see here he's just going to go ahead and play down the Firefly and Backstab out the Enchanted Raven. So. You know, plays a minion, gets the druid off the board, and that's really what matters, and is actually going to be very heavily rewarded. Uh, the the Mark of Yasiraj would have actually been a big deal there. Yeah, honestly, I, I really did like that play from Tyler there. The the Completing the quest with the Firefly is something that you really don't ever need to rely on, because you can always complete it with Flame Elemental afterwards. So losing that one proc on the quest just, just doesn't matter at all. Now it's another complicated turn for Tyler, though, as he could play the, the quest and I guess summon Swashburglar, trade into the Direwolf. But you don't want to pull out um, patches this early if you can get away with it. Quite but this is certainly, but this is certainly a matchup where the question of can I get away with it really yeah. is kind of a question you're asking yourself a lot because well, you really can't afford to be very greedy at all against Aggro Druid. That said, it, 
it seems clear that Waning Moon has missed the Innervate. He's missed the, the kind of explosive start that this deck can sometimes yeah. have. So Tyler can kind of just try to go uh, blow for blow with him pretty honestly in the beginning if he chooses to. If he does want to go ahead and play the Crystal Core, though, yeah, I think Swashburger is going to have to be uh, the order of business. That's fine. It's turn two, and you've managed to clear the Druid's board. That's not a bad start, actually. Uh, yeah. Considering Druids sometimes start with, with Fireflies and Flame Elementals and Mark of the Lotuses, their own Blood Cell Corsair. Ooh. Fledgling being picked up on three, though. Do you know how many... doesn't have a way of dealing with it, either. Oh. I was going to say, you know how many times you, you don't play Vicious Fledgling on three against the Quest Rogue? It, basically, never. Yeah. Yeah. Place your shot, though. Tyler didn't have a way of dealing with it before. Still doesn't have a way of dealing with it, but he does have a way of slowing it down slightly. I also think the... Uh, is it Adult Grizzly? Yep. Is that what that card's called? I think the Adult Grizzly could be played nicely this turn as well, coin out the Glacial Shard afterwards, and suddenly the Quest Rogue might have a, an aggressive board of his own. I think priority one is dealing with that Vicious Fledgling. You, you just cannot let it connect. If it gets uh, Wind Fury uh, and some of the other neat buffs it can get, then it pretty much just blows the game wide open. But yeah, I don't necessarily mind the idea of Adult Grizzly coin Glacial Shard. Yeah. Um, just getting the Adult Grizzly developed, really, because there's a strong chance you would just end up bouncing the Glacial Shard anyway. Yeah. with the Pendar and Brewmaster in this matchup. Could just throw down the Igneous Elemental, but again, it doesn't deal... Uh, well, Igneous Elemental coin, Glacial Shard, would actually deal with the uh, Fledgling as well. Just, if he gets the Adult Grizzly down now, he's just able to continue making beefier minions, and then, in a weird way, it kind of offsets one of the, the costs of the deck, which is playing weak minions, because they just get stronger. Exactly. I just think this thing can get so much value in the in the Quest Rogue, because cards like Igneous Elemental, that then spawns two more fire uh, Flame Elementals. Not Fire Elementals, that would be a little bit extreme. But um, And the, the resources just keep on coming, and it's sort of like, yeah, you haven't completed the quest yet, but they're not, so they're not quite 5-5s, five but they're not 1-1s one anymore either. Right. Yeah, they, they're, they're much more capable of actually battling for the board, yeah. which is a consideration point for the Netherlands. Uh, speaking of consideration points, Waning Moon getting the swipe off the top, so has interesting options there. If he swiped the Glacial Shard, then at least it can't be balanced. You get rid of the 1-1. One, one. Unfortunately, through the Grizzled or Addled Grizzly and the Dagger, you know your Vicious Fledgling is going to die. But even if you mark of Yasiraj the Vicious Fledgling and Power of the Wilded, you also know it's going to die. Yeah, I definitely think the swipe has to come down this turn, but I don't think the Philippines are going to feel very good about it. They're not going to want to leave the Adult Grizzly alive either, for the same reason that we were discussing a moment ago. The Rogue has the ability to put so many things out right. at once from the hand. It is, it is an interesting decision because you have to consider a number of different arguments there. Uh, but I think what you arrive at is, leaving up the Adult Grizzly, you know his deck is full of cheap minions, so he's going to get value out of that. The Glacial Shard might not get bounced. Maybe there's just not a bounce in the hand. As it happens, though, I don't think Tyler's going to want to going to worry about bouncing it. He's going to make the trade and, yeah, drop Igneous Elemental, drop Flame Elemental. With the youthful Brewmaster in hand, he has all of the tools that he needs ready to go to complete this quest. Philippines now firmly on the back foot in this game. Yeah, hand doesn't really do them a whole lot. They can. The Power of the Wild is, is a great card, certainly, for the flexibility. And, yeah, you can make the 2-3-2 th cats. But you're playing them right into the Igneous Elemental, which is going to pop. You're going to give your opponent the Flame Elementals. It's just a very unsatisfying situation. Could just choose to yeah, mark up Yasiraj and at least make something that you think is going to uh, force the Dagger to come out to deal with. This is quite a desperate play, right? Waning Moon trying to dig through his deck, pick up some of these these big threats like Living Mana and Bitter Tide Hydra. It's so important now as the Quest Rogue, without even completing the quest, is controlling the board. This is madness. Madness. This is Quest Rogue. Yeah. Yeah, no, it is happening, though. It, sometimes the Swashburglar, the upside of it is it sometimes it just gives you tools that you, you aren't expecting to have, your opponent isn't expecting you to have, and they allow you to uh, navigate the matchup in, in a very specific manner. And we saw Adult Grizzly was actually low-key very important. The buff on the Glacial Shard allowed for that Vicious Fledgling to actually die. Yeah, it would have changed things dramatically if the buff wasn't there. Tyler would have had to hero power to get the dagger out to, to get rid of the fledgling. He wouldn't have had the mana to play the Igneous Elemental that turn. It would have slowed him down dramatically. Glacial Shard picked up here does mean that he can just put a stop to that panther without worrying about it too much. I don't think he's going to want to bounce it because that actually slows down his quest completion in this position. He's going to want to use the bounce on one of these flame elementals. 
One thing I do want to point out as well is we were discussing yesterday how Swashburglar isn't always an inclusion in Quest Rogue anymore because you don't want it to pull out the patches, but yeah. uh, by virtue of putting it in his deck, Tyler essentially guaranteed himself the chance to get a random card from his opponent, so uh, he got that resource because he was willing to play around the potential of drawing out patches as well as Galaka Crawler, yeah. and, and ultimately is rewarded for that, and that's one of the reasons I really like Swashburglar. Well, it seemed to have gone out where all of the players claimed that, that it was a bad card, and now it's come back in again, as we see it more regularly than we don't see it. Against uh, aggressive decks, it's important to pull out the patches early, so um, it just makes sense. Backstab being picked up off of the Moving Pod there is one of the best cards I think Tyler could have gotten. Again, against the Agro Druid specifically. Oh yeah, especially at this point, you you pretty much just lock him out of the game. Yeah, just a free zero mana deal with one of these threats. And there you go, gets rid of everything. Not even worried about putting all three of these minions on the board. There's no way Waning Moon deals with all three of them. He actually has nothing that he can do apart from play this Panther. Waning Moon, he is no small threat himself. He came second place 2016 uh, APAC Southeast Asia Spring Championships, losing out to his HGG teammate, Staz. Uh, he, he's no, he's no small, small fry on the Hearthstone scene. Certainly the Philippines has a number of players who have competitive experience actually on the global stage, which is not always something we necessarily see from Southeast Asia. Mm -hmm. So it is good to, to have that kind of leadership and that experience he, on just, this team. But he's just competitive across the board. He's a former StarCraft pro as well. Yeah. Yeah, Waiting Moon, uh, certainly a foe to be reckoned with. Unfortunately, in this situation, even though this is a favorable matchup, the Swashburglar ended up coming up big. And to Tyler's credit, Tyler did navigate this really well. Uh, you know, he had a number of options there from the very beginning. You know, did he want to play the quest? A lot of people might have been baited into playing that quest, thinking, okay, well, that's the point of the, the deck, right? I have to do this to win. But he understood that playing down the Firefly, getting that backstab to remove the Enchanted Raven was just strictly better in that situation. So, uh, yeah, Waning Moon it looks like he's going to take an early loss here, but I like how this match was played from both uh, players. A lot of people say they don't like losing against Quest Rogue, but then I always counter with Quest Rogue's actually very hard to play. Tyler is one of these players who is going to know how to play it. He grinds so much every day. I don't remember the exact numbers he said, but he gets one hour which isn't used on sleep and isn't used on Hearthstone, and that's it. I would actually counter your statement by saying, oh. cool story, Bob, and I still hate losing the Quest Rogue. Okay. Yeah. But I appreciate that it was a good story. Yeah. Yeah. Quest I, I, coming online, though. I cool story bobbed you yesterday, so you, you, it's only fair that you've thrown it back at me. Truce? Yeah. Okay. I think so. Let's leave the cool story Bob to Twitch chat. <laughs> All right. Well, Quest online, and uh, this one is firmly locked up in the favor of the Netherlands, but if Waning Moon wants to, he can play both Savage Roars and Innervate. If only there was a force of nature in that hand. If only. Before the nerf. Obviously. Pre, well, not, yeah. not the current one, that'd be a bit useless. Tyler takes the first win for Team Netherlands. Nice little smile from him, but shouldn't be a, a huge surprise from anyone. Waning Moon, a great player, but Tyler, also a great player. Very, very popular for a reason. Uh, I say this every week because I think he deserves it. If you haven't seen Tyler's stream, I think it is worth you go check it out. Right, and you know, both of these players certainly very great in their own right, but it's worth noting that Tyler had the tools to just disassemble the, the Druid win condition early, so it was certainly something where he took advantage of the cards he had, got something off the Swashburglar there, so yeah, early win for the Netherlands. Let's go ahead and take a look at the matchup next. We have Theo taking on Chalk. It's gonna be Paladin versus Warrior. Now, Chalk is uh, someone that I've actually talked to a fair bit, and he was saying that even though Singapore's, or sorry, Philippines is coming in here with a 2-3 record and a 10-10 match record, uh, they they're basically just have a short memory, right? They're gonna put it behind them. This is a fresh start for them, clean slate. They can come in here and prove themselves against the established teams. And they, they recognize that taking on the Netherlands is absolutely gonna be a challenge. Yeah, well, you can't get too confident anyway, even if you're against a team that you're, you're not as afraid of as the Netherlands, maybe. You don't go this far in the tournament and then just chill out and be like, oh, we're good. We're just gonna beat everyone. Because you get to the point where the teams you're against are going to be even better across the board than the teams you were against before, as they're only the ones that got through. So it, it makes sense to be wary. And uh, yeah, just doing a reset like that, I like the uh, I like the chain of thought there. Right, and, and Chalk also identified that Singapore at points made plays that were a little shaky, a little suboptimal. And you know, he says they need to work on that, but they, they definitely feel like by virtue of getting to stage two, it gives them a little bit more confidence and the drive to just try even harder. So I like... I like Singapore kind of coming to terms with the fact that, yeah, if you look at kind of how this lines up, they're certainly the underdog, but yep. they're they're not going to let it get to their heads because certainly in tournament, uh, one of the more low-key 
uh, problems that you can have is coming up against an opponent you think is just better than you. Yeah. And then you let it get to your head, and you're not thinking about the game, right? You're thinking about the, the team on the other side of the computer. Philippines have done some amazing things so far in this tournament. So being too afraid of their opponents definitely wouldn't be a wise move. But then Netherlands, we saw their, their game score earlier from stage one. It's something stupid, like 13, 13 and 5. five. Right? It is a 72% yeah. win rate. It's just, that is... They took, and mind you, the, three of those losses came when they obviously lost to the USA. Yeah. In four other games, four other series, they only lost twice. They lost two games. That's like the opposite of the UK's game record. Uh, excuse me, the trailer at the beginning of this tells me the UK always wins. Well... Is Sato lying? I guess Sato's lying. Can't trust anybody. Can't trust him again, no. But you can trust this pirate warrior coming up to <laughs> want to be really aggressive, regardless of what the paladin is. We see here from Theo's hand that he is certainly playing a more uh, late game oriented paladin. But, okay, oh. Nazos first mate absolutely saves that. Yeah, things just got dramatically better for Chalk there. As he just he was taking, taking a sip of his drink there. I had to stop when he saw Nazos first mate. It's like, okay, let's take this game into overdrive. Take a big sip of Nazos first mate and just get going. He actually has a, a pretty tough choice here. Like, do you coin out the South Sea deck hand, sink that two damage in now, or do you wait next turn, coin out the South Sea captain, turn these 1-1s one into 2-2s? Two I actually don't think this is a tough call at all. I think your three drops are on next turn are strictly going to be better than South Sea deckhand, especially when your next turn was essentially just going to be upgrade. Yeah. So I actually really like South Sea Captain or Blood Cell Cultist. I think you want to evaluate what your opponent does. If they just make the hero power and you can deal with it with the Rusty Hook, Ooh. then I think you just go ahead and just play the Cultist. Yep. Kind of already want to say this game looks over. That's a little bit preemptive, but this start Chalk's got is insane. Actually, maybe you Captain. Captain represents more damage immediately. I prefer the so you captain. Because yeah. yeah. you can just use the hook to, to trade in. Yep. And... Oh? No, just going with Cultist, I guess. I mean, it, both are good. Both are really solid. I guess you can captain next turn, and then you buff the Cultist as well. It becomes a 4-5. Uh, sure. <laughs> oh, boy. I'm just staring blankly at Theo's hand now, just trying to work out how he comes back. He's got the Adult Peacekeepers. They will slow Chalk down a little bit. Problem is, Chalk, no matter what happens here, is going to be able to clear the board and just keep pushing damage to the face. I think, though, by the time it comes out to slow him down, uh, Philippines could already be at the finish line, so it's like that yeah, exactly. somebody like heckling you right as you cross the finish line, nah, get out of my face. Yeah. So I see Captain now gonna do its job. Having to make a slightly inefficient trade this turn, assuming that Chalk is trading, I imagine he puts one of the two twos and his weapon in. One interesting wrinkle is had the captain been played what? inside of the cultist, the Dread Corsair would have been a 4 4 and could have just been left up to contest the Elder Peacekeeper. Right. It was played. Yeah, it would have been three mana, but you have exactly three mana. Yeah. So, it, I mean, obviously, it, it, that's not a consideration you're really making in that play, I think, but. Is it. Hmm. What about upgrade Southie Deck Cannon and Dread Corsair this turn? Upgrade, hit the weapon in, go face with everything else. It's not playing into Consecration too much because the Dread Corsair and the Cultist both survive. And the next turn you can guarantee play South Sea Captain and buff everything that does survive up. I do think I like that line of play just in the interest of protecting your board from Elder Peacekeeper. <laughs> Obviously you want to keep the Paladin off the board and at this point the Paladin is playing minions fairly inefficiently. Yeah. So you just kind of want to go. Uh, I, do, I do think in for a penny, in for a pound here. Go ahead and just get that deckhand down and get the get the damage going. If Consecration comes out, fine, it dies. If not, you you have the opportunity to just push two damage for multiple turns. Yeah, you get a heavily... Oh, oh wow. Yeah. That's... Philippines got down to the wire there. You know, that's exactly what they were talking about happened in stage one. Yeah. You know, they had some plays where they were trying to figure things out, the, the rope winded down, and uh, that could potentially come back to, to bite them. Yeah, it's not going to end up being too bad here, as, as Chalk would have had the option to just not play the deckhand that turn, and the next turn play it with South Sea Captain. So we're just going to pretend that that's the line he went for, I think. <laughs> um, it's possible. We see their, their cam actually went out as well, that they might have had a slight connection issue there. Yeah. But uh, anyway, focusing on what's going on now, the South Sea Captain comes down, uh, buffs up all these pirates, and yeah. Uh, Theo actually has a way out now. If he if he picks up the equality off the top, then he can drop the Pyromancer, play the equality. That would leave Chalk with only the three attack weapon. Well, it's basically a Fiery Works now. That would only leave Chalk with the Fiery Works on the board. Hmm. But he needs to get the equality. That's the only way I can see this game going on. That deckhand just refusing to attack. Hmm. Yeah, I don't think... 
I mean, this is, this is not intentional, so I don't know if there's maybe a bug or something. But... That hand just wants to attack face. Theo not picking up what he needs to put a stop to this anyway. He's got the Stampeding Coda that will deal with one minion. <sighs> but nothing relevant. I'm going to drop Harrison instead, get the card draw that makes sense. Hoping to pick up an equality, I imagine. That's good, too. Yeah, there's 14 damage on board. So that is uh, just... Well, with, with the Coconut Elite's lethal. Yeah. Well, that's assuming that Salsi Deccan can actually <laughs> attack. Like, I'm not joking. Like, we've seen him not attack twice now, and I do actually kind of wonder if there's something going on here. What now? Yeah, what now indeed, Garrosh? We're just sitting here with bated breath, waiting to see what happens. Okay, Captain's made the attack. Theo has just got this little smirk on his face. Like, what's going on right now? Am I being BM'd? <laughs> nope. That deck hand just doesn't want to attack. Yeah, that is that is not intentional. There there has to be something wrong. That is incredible. I've never seen anything like this. Yeah. Obviously Theo should have just been dead. Now, Theo can just come back with Pyromancer Consecration. It's not completely safe, but it does clear everything that Chalk has if he trades the house and then as well to the Dread Corsair. So Chalk gonna have to pick up some damage and pretty fast. Stegadon is another option for Theo, but I don't think he survives through that. Does he? Well, certainly not with the Spellbreaker. No, of course. Yeah. I'm just looking at the board. No, there's, there's enough damage on board that would kill him if he played the Stegodon. Oh, apart from the... I'm counting the deck hand. Maybe I shouldn't be. I was going to say, maybe maybe Theo's not either. Anyway, the Spellbreaker is just going to come down, and that's going to end the game. Uh, this one should have been over actually a couple turns ago, but there did appear to be some kind of issue. Philippines going to just go ahead and rip out that upgrade, and that's how they're going to get done after, you know, the deck hand not working for them. So even with the uh, Pyramids of Concentration, Shaw could have taken that away. Justice was served in the end as yeah. Chalk did get the win. Quite a relief for me. There you go. There's Chalk looking looking pretty good right now. I like uh, I like Chalk. You know, just very simple guy. <laughs> Blue and white. Shaped like a shaped like a human. Yeah, good looking. Yeah. Um, Chalk has a lot of history with Pirate Warrior, actually. He took a, a long break from Hearthstone last year, and then when he came back, he just leaped to High Legend with his own uh, kind of different take on Pirate Warrior. Right. Uh, so he, he's a very, very good player with the deck. Who cares if he can't attack with a Southsea deckhand? <laughs> Big deal. Like, he can still win games with it. Right. No, Chaka, obviously, as players from Southeast Asia do, or he plays on the Americas region, and uh, you can catch him frequently at the, the high ranks of Legend Ladder, uh, testing out different decks. But, yeah, early win for Philippines. That has to make them feel good. As we talked about, the Netherlands is certainly an intimidating opponent. But yep. that matchup, uh, certainly... Well, sorry, it's going to be a Thai series now. Yeah. Yes, yes, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Thai series. But uh, that is a good win for them to go ahead and get. That was certainly one that favored the Philippines, given how slow that Paladin deck is. Yep. Chalk did win that. That's that's a mistake in the graphic there. That's why it's just disappeared, and you can see us again right now. I'm sure that's being corrected as we speak. Yes, us, casters, people talking. Now All it's right. good. All right, we're going we're gonna to take one more look at that graphic. There you go. This time for sure. All right. Next up is going to be Ties versus Stars. Ties it needs no introduction. This guy's been at the Hearthstone World Championship twice now. Obviously an incredibly skilled player, big time streamer. Uh, cost a lot of people some packs last year, but yeah, <laughs> that's uh, that's the lowest thing on the resume. Saz, you know, certainly we saw him, I want to say at the America's Championship in 2014, first event I actually ever worked. Wow. Yeah. Back wow. in the day. Yep. Saz been around for a long time then. Uh, I, I just noticed that we are going to see as many mages in this next game as we saw all day yesterday. Yeah. Which is uh, pretty strange when you think about it. Over the last few weeks, Mage has been established. Uh, specifically, the Discover, the Gunther Mage, has been established as one of the best decks in Hearthstone. Uh, it's been so powerful that people have started throwing Eater of Secrets into their Mages and sometimes Rogues and other decks. So um, I can't help but think that might be one of the reasons that no one's been playing Mage uh, this week so far. It is a pretty crazy timeline when you can just run Eater of Secrets because back in the day, if you ran Eater of Secrets in a deck and Sottle found out, <laughs> he would just hunt you down. It was like the ring. He would just crawl out of your screen and just get you. Because uh, Eater of Secrets was for a long time, certainly 
the mage secrets being the most powerful, that's realistically the only time I think you'd ever consider it. Uh, the Eater of Secrets does not run to deal with Paladin Secrets. It is run strictly to deal with Mage yeah, Secrets. Yeah, it looked like the reason that it was brought into the game at, at, the, at, at the start was to deal with Paladin Secrets with the Mysterious Challenger, but after Avenge rotated out, Secret Paladin sort of was never a, never a thing again. But as you say, dealing with Mage Secrets, dealing with that Ice Block and just sneaking this early win is a uh, very powerful way of using the card. Now, I imagine... Both of these players are running Eater of Secrets. I think it might be one of the reasons they both chose to bring Mage, because they saw it's going to line up against the other Mage. Oh, oh hang on. That's a Blizzard. Is Philippines using Freeze Mage? Uh, Philippines might be. It's very clear the Netherlands is not, though. They have Sorcerer's Apprentice. I'm very curious what this style of Mage actually is, because Sorcerer's Apprentice would generally be indicative of something a little more aggressive. Uh, right. We have seen it kind of tacked into some of the, the Gunther-esque mages. Well, there's a Medivh there as well. So, so the Medivh te definitely tells you it's got more more late game going. Yeah. Yeah, it's always exciting these days to watch mage games because you're not... You can never just be 100% sure you know what it is because mage is so powerful and so flexible right now that you can kind of just take in and out certain uh, different cards. Sorcerer's Apprentice is, is just a, a great way of filling the uh, the cheap minion slots as well. It's one of those cards that, that gets put in to replace Cabal Courier. Sometimes there's a Pyros in there, but the real strength of Sorcerer's Apprentice now is actually how strong it is with Primordial Glyph. The fact that you can play the Sorcerer's Apprentice and Glyph on turn three and then get a spell that has a three mana discount. Right. That's a lot of discount in total there. Well, we see the Arcanologist come out, and I like the coin here from Tice. You go ahead and get that down. Chip damage is kind of a big thing for the mage, and especially in this mirror. Mm -hmm. If you can get the Arcanologist to maybe push two, four, six damage if it's not checked by a Frostbolt, that's a big win, as well as pulling the secret actually out of your deck. This definitely looks like a freeze mage for Staz here, and I believe one of the reasons that Discover Mage got so popular in the first place is because it's so strong against the freeze mage. The fact that it can both deal a lot of burn damage in the long run, but also put minions on the board over and over again just gives it a slight edge. All right, we'll see Spellbender, Flame Geyser, and Forbidden Flame. Uh, Forbidden Flame is actually, it kind of flies under the radar, but it's pretty solid removal. It just feels bad taking it because you don't get a discount on it. Right, and more importantly, it's not burn. Um, yeah. The Flame Geyser, you know, you could just put that in there for an extra bit, bit of two damage, and then you, you are able to put out a minion. Freeze Mage specifically is still not running a lot of minions, so maybe getting something on the board feels good. Although, if you did it this turn, uh, it would be immediately checked by the Archaeologist. Spellbender, uh, certainly powerful if you have priority minions you want to protect. Yeah, Spellbender is the sneaky pick, because you can sort of, first you pretend it's a counter spell, then maybe Tice assumes that it's an ice block and just ignores it and forgets about it for a while. And the next thing you know, it's saving your Antonidas from a fireball. So that, that I think, is the thinking behind the pick for Spellbender. You're going to play Antonidas, Alexstrasza, the big threats later. If you can somehow get these minions to survive, they can make a huge impact on the game. Right, and, you know, in certain decks for mages right now, you are playing more minions than others. So if you're playing very few minions, you can kind of set up the Spellbender and then decide when you actually want it to protect a minion because uh, you're not playing very many. Right. Turn two for Tice now. A little bit tricky. You could drop the Sorcerer's Apprentice, but that's a bit of a risk because it could just die to a Frostbolt or something, and you, you want to definitely get the value from it at some point. There's a Pyro Blast there, Rob. I mean, this lines up pretty pretty straightforward for me. Pyro Blast certainly just having more burn. You know, you, Alex Straza is probably in this deck. Alex Straza and a lot of the mage decks that are not focused on the early game. So uh, Pyro Blast seems like a pretty straightforward pick there. Yeah, you mentioned the Sorcerer's Apprentice, but it's definitely... Sorcerer's Apprentice in there, it, you're using it for more than just its body. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, you also want its card power. Oh, and next turn, Tice can, again, get that huge Sorcerer's Apprentice turn I described earlier. Just Apprentice, Primordial Glyph, get a big-ish spell and play it straight away as well. Not going to waste any time here. What is going on? I can hear sounds. Oh, it's the... Yeah. the uh, Looking for that... Uh, it's the fruit. That golden fruit. All right, another Primordial Glyph coming. We're already seeing three. So, Greater Arcane Missiles is also just more burn. Shatter is, is realistically just kind of a dead option almost every single time you see it. Um, Ice Barrier. Ice Barrier could be good. It obviously protects you, gives you some extra HP to work with, but uh, you haven't seen that many minions thus far. Yeah. So maybe you're thinking uh, Ice Barrier is just not the play. Our Greater Arcane Missiles has the flexibility of technically being removal and burn. We've seen some pretty poor Primordial Glyphs here. Not the one where Ty's got Pyroblast, but the one from Stars as well. Um, some very approximate stats for you, Rob. 
there's about a 25% chance of getting three bad options every time you play Primordial Glyph. Mm. And we define bad options as Spellbenders, Forbidden Flame, Flame Geysers, Shatter, that tier of spells. There's sure. about a 25% chance of all three being that bad. And I think we've had two sets of bad options here. Greater Arcane Missiles isn't so bad for Tice because it can be nine burst damage for four mana. Well, third Ice Block seems pretty good to me here, although Volcanic Potion, for what you're staring down on the board, might just go ahead and just be the pick. If he, if Staz is playing uh, Freeze Mage, Volcanic Potion is probably not going to be in the list, yeah. since it's more oriented towards Doomsayer and Frost Novas, and we already see the Frost Nova. Ice Block is usually a premium pick from, a, from Primordial Glyph, especially when you're playing this type of deck. My only concern would be you don't want to just be relying on Ice Blocks if there is the threat of your opponent running the Eater of Secrets that we were talking about earlier. Right. So it doesn't matter how many ice blocks you got. You can have five ice blocks in your deck if your opponent's got Eater of Secrets. You're still going to lose the first time your opponent has lethal. So I do like the Volcanic Potion pick here. All right, so one minion down. We'll be able to clear that off next turn with the Hero Power. Also develops a Spellbender. Tice is going to make note that that secret was played for one mana, so it's obviously the second card that came off of Primordial Glyph. Two ice blocks from Tice now. He's sitting on a lot of burn here. So if he develops the ice block, he floats a mana. Could just choose to uh, hero power and possibly even throw in the Frostbolt. I mean, look, he's got a lot of burn. Mm, I'm wondering if it'd be better to actually drop Medea's Valet than to, than to play the Frostbolt. I mean, you're going to get the value. You're going to get the three damage off the Medea's Valet next turn. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so he just goes ahead and develops the ice block. That's fine. I, th I think despite the fact of Floats of Mana, it's the best play there. It does feel sad playing with his Valet and not getting the three damage, especially when you have secrets in hand. So yeah. it makes sense to not go there. I wouldn't like wasting the Frostbolt. You don't like just chucking like the Frostbolt? Nah, I don't like that until sure. you've got like a, a sort of firm strategy of how you're going to win the game in two or three turns. Well, I mean, it's turn, f it's turn four for him. He has a lot of burn already. Yeah. I don't necessarily think it's optimal. I just think that if, if I were to see someone do that, I would at least understand the reasoning, which is, okay, I have a lot of burn. I'm just going to go for it. I don't I don't have to wait on an Alex Straza play because I've got a Pyroblast already, and there's probably another one in the deck. He had to play around um, Counterspell there as well, so he, he just dropped the Ice Block, realizing that that was a possibility. Random secret from Primordial Glyph. It could have been Counterspell. Now he, they're going to expect the Ice Block, I imagine. If you were testing for Counterspell, though, wouldn't you have wanted to just play the Frostbolt? I feel like the Ice Block is the more important card. Uh, it's just well, a thought, yeah. Yeah, I mean, Netherlands decided to go this way, and I guess that means, like you said, they're understanding they've got a lot of burn damage. They don't want to waste any of it. They want that to all be going face, and they believe that they're not going to need both ice blocks to win this game. Okay, so interesting use of the Frost Nova. Rather than to ping the minion, they're just going to go ahead and develop the Blood Mage Thalnos and Frost Nova the board. I gotta be honest, that's a head scratcher for me. Frost Nova Thalnos. I, if you're out there watching and you know the explanation for this one, please feel free to tweet me because that is just an honest, like weird one to me. Yeah, ping seems like it would have made. Yeah, just oh, ping. Oh, we're just testing for counter spell. Mm, I guess you, that's fair. You haven't seen enough at this point. Excuse me. You yeah, no, that's fair. It's probably just that. That's but all so I can why would, think of anyway. I mean, you want to test for, I guess, Mirror Entity or Potion of Polymorph there, and that's why you don't ping. It just seems weird to me to do it on that turn, but yeah. No, I mean, it makes sense testing for secrets. I mean, these, these are the mind games that secrets can play on you. It was sure. an incredibly inefficient turn, and the Netherlands were probably as confused about it as we were. Because you, you saw him pay three mana for it. So generally what that tells you is... Most of the time, you're safe to assume that it, it could at least be Ice Block because Ice Block is basically running everything. But I guess maybe since you saw the Sorcerer's Apprentice, you assume this could be more aggressive and Counterspell could be in it. Right. Yeah. But then if it's more aggressive, then you might be inclined to want to save the Frost Nova. Yeah, it's... If it's running Medivh, then you're also going to want to save the Frost Nova for later on when Ty summons this board full of minions. So uh, you're right, it is a head scratcher. They went exactly where Tice wanted them missiles. to Those missiles. Look at that. Look Good at that. missiles. Look at that laugh from Tice after that. Yeah, you know, it's just... Tice, Tice saying in the video, or, what was it, Tyler saying in the video that Tice wasn't a, wasn't a smork player? We know better. <laughs> we saw where those missiles went. He's, maybe he's not a smork player at heart, but the game is trying to turn him into a smork player. It is the dark like side. <laughs> 
That was just Tyler and Mitsuhide's influence. Look at him rubbing his hands together. He's so happy about those missiles. <laughs> Anyways, we're um, we're almost there now with the... Um... I don't think it's quite a two-turn lethal. But it can be. 7 plus 5, Frostbolt, Frostbolt, Ping. Violence portal. That would do it. And as we can see, that's a Spellbender, not an Ice Block represented on Staz's side of the board. Right, and th this really touches on why Spellbender is a, considered a subpar secret. Now, if Spellbender could do that with a secret that hit you or a minion, then suddenly Spellbender's really good. Yeah. But a little bit limited. If that if that is the strategy Tice is going to take here, I'm surprised he's gone Firelands Portal because that has the potential of getting a uh, Corrupted Healbot. And if he got a Corrupted Healbot from that... Um, Firelands Portal, it would have been a disaster. I would have preferred Frostbolt, Frostbolt, Ping there to set up for the lethal and then Firelands Portal next turn. Sure. But now, yeah, definitely no possibility of that happening on, on the play you're suggesting. But now Eater of Secrets picked up from Staz. I don't think it's going to matter too much. What to do? What to do? Well, Staz has the Alexstrasza. He has to play Ice Block this turn. Yeah. And he surely understands that he has to play Ice Block this turn. There is no way Tice doesn't have lethal here. Yeah, this turn could certainly just be block, barrier, ping. Mm -hmm. And then trade. Yeah. Yeah, you're definitely, you're definitely trading. Wait, do you trade if you're putting up the barrier? This might be the last time that there's a minion on the board to proc it. Um, you would assume at some point there's probably like an Alex Straza coming down. Like that sure. thing is fine. She's basically, what are you doing with the other three mana there? Yeah. I mean, I guess you could Frostbolt and, you know, save one of your minions, but... I don't know. I think I like the Frostbolt better just because it's burn. He's hoping there's no Eater of Secrets on his opponent's side of the board. As that would... I wouldn't quite end the game. Eater of Secrets, Frostbolt, Frostbolt, Ping is not quite possible from Tice here. So. Okay. So he actually just goes ahead and realizes that since he's put up the armor, he's just going to get value from it here. Yeah. Yeah, I don't mind this. No, I, I don't mind it either. I just think at some point you are probably bound to run into uh, minion damage from the board. Things get good for, for well, not good for Philippines here, but things get okay for Philippines as they can play a defensive Alex Straza Yeah. And yeah, trade away the second rate bruiser. You don't want to be the person playing a defensive Alex Straza here. It's kind of like a race. And if you're the first person having to do that, you're losing. But you can't do anything else this turn, so... I bring life. Well, now Tice can just Meteor this away. He's got a defensive Alexstrasza for later. Though he probably won't get the chance to play this defensive Alexstrasza, as Staz has the Eater of Secrets in his hand. Sort of a shortcut to winning the race, Eater of Secrets. Yeah, hmm... Can still set up that two-turn lethal. You like just Pyroblast him? Hmm. Healbot, uh, sorry, Firelands Portal is still risky because of the Corrupted Healbot. If you're going to set up a two-turn lethal, you, you prefer to play the Firelands Portal second just because of that one negative outcome. Yeah, I mean, you've seen one one Ice Block at this point. You've seen Alex Draza. Your, your opponent is starting to run short on ways to, to heal themselves. Don't forget, neither of these secrets that Staz has is a uh, is an ice block. One right. is Spellbender, yep. and one is uh, Ice Barrier. So one thing to note is, because of the way the Netherlands are choosing to approach this, they did leave the Alexstrasza up, and the Alexstrasza is just going to get to connect over and over until it's dealt with. And because that Eater of Secrets is there for the Philippines, this, this might actually be closer than it looks. Nah, it's, it's over now. I don't think there's any way Staz can survive this next turn. Oh, right, because the block isn't up. No, I'm yeah. sorry. Just completely forgot that. And for, yep. I, I got pretty excited because I thought the Archaeologist was going to pick up the second ice block. But right. It wasn't meant to be, and sadly, uh, if Tice did try and clear the Alexstrasza, Spellbender would have procced and prevented it, and Alexstrasza would have kept pummeling the face, but unfortunately for Staz, he didn't get the second ice block, and Tice takes away game number three for the Netherlands. Yeah, the Harrison Jones with a little bit of subtle BM is, as that game belongs in a museum as it ends right there. But, yeah, 
that was uh, really well navigated by the Netherlands. Just go ahead and like look at all the burn they had. Those greater arcane missiles going face oh. really changed the texture of that game. Yeah, dramatically yeah. so, because Tice had the exact two-turn lethal setup afterwards. Right. If one of those missiles had missed, he'd have had to find three extra damage somewhere. That may have taken an extra turn. That extra turn may have been long enough for Staz to find the second ice block. Yeah, it was certainly, you know, we saw the Archonologist pull a secret. Could have absolutely been the ice block there. So more time obviously equates to more chances. But yeah, well played by the Netherlands. The Primordial Glyphs, you know, as they tend to do, were certainly relevant in that game in, in terms of uh, where the direction of that game went. So let's go ahead and take a look at the matchup now. We're going to head into game number four. It's going to be Mitsuhide versus Karakute. Mitsuhide on the Warrior. Karakute going to be on the Shaman. Now, we said yesterday that Shaman right now is essentially mostly just token shaman but i want to point out yesterday two of the shamans we saw one from singapore was the elemental shaman and then from uh bulgaria i, I want to say it was yeah bulgaria we saw that jade echo shaman so uh, it seems like other people are kind of maybe valuing shaman differently yeah you're right jade echo shaman elemental shaman just two though two out of seven yeah. we saw um so yesterday in the Hearthstone Global Games, there were four series, which means there were eight opportunities for Shaman to come out. And we saw Shaman seven times. It's not surprising. It, it, Shaman right now is, you know, you said it yourself, you know, at the beginning of Journey to Angoro, the year of the Mammoth Meta, Shaman, you know, people were finally like, all right, well, Ton of Trog, gone, Totem Golem, gone. Shaman's just finally just going to take its seat on the bench with Gul'dan. But uh, it has certainly come back in a big way. It's it's kind of a different trend to yesterday, though. It's, sorry, to, to today. As yesterday, we saw two mages total. Today, Series 1, we've seen two mages. And one of the players has passed up on their shaman already. Yeah. So um, it's just funny how the how the days are different. I look forward to seeing how that continues later on. But it's going to be the quest warrior versus the, the token shaman. All right, well, this is going to be game point for the Netherlands. I just need to get one more win on this quest warrior. So we talked yesterday because we, we saw this matchup. And... The warrior has a powerful number of removal opportunities to, to deal with these shamans uh, just constantly populating board. One of the areas where it can suffer, though, is getting the card draw and getting the resources. Yeah. So they have to be very conservative while still playing around the potential for Brawl. It's one of, the many, lust, rather. It's one of the many matchups where the, the warrior is, is more and more favored the later into the game we get. Um, I, I would say that the warrior is a slight favorite here, but the, it, it needs to pick up, like Ravaging Ghoul plus Sleep with the Fishes as early as possible. That Brawl is going to help a lot. But we discussed yesterday a lot, there is this dance that takes place as Karakute is going to somewhat play around the Brawl, but not want to play around the Brawl too much because she'd like to bait it out when there's not too much down. All right, well, Quest comes down, so at least now the Philippines know exactly what they're dealing with. And their, their opening hand here is not bad at all. They're going to be able to populate the board pretty nicely. And then there, there's kind of a point where you may consider just wanting your opponent to brawl. So you may just go ahead on the next turn and only play one of your minions, throw in a hero power. The hero power is always super important in the intricate dance between Shaman and Warrior. Exactly. Just because they're free minions. They're free minions which do amount to a threat when played in combination with Bloodlust or even in a desperate position Evolve. Um, and they're cheap minions that... Mitsuhide is going to need to get rid of, but is not going to want to waste resources getting rid of, because those resources need to go on the bigger minions later on, like Aya and the big Jade Golems. Certainly whatever comes off of Stonehill Defender as well, there's the potential to run into White Eyes Alec here. Oh, and the Armorsmith is, is really strong here, just going to be able to check the board constantly if not dealt with. Not only generate armor, but just get rid of the 1-1 one, one Murlocs. Right. And drawing patches for the Philippines, you know, we... Obviously, we and every other Hearthstone caster since Patches uh, was released, that is, that is not something you want to do. It's not. Do we need a new swear jar for that? We always talk about the, uh, the priest having priest minions and four attack swear jar. Is that another one? Maybe. Don't draw Patches. Uh, they drew Patches. They don't want to do that. I really hope when somebody's casting one day, they're like, oh my god, no, he misplayed. He drew the Patches. <laughs> Just go like full star, uh, actual like StarCraft. Taste Toast is casting on it. All right, well, the Claw's going to go ahead and come out. The Armorsmith will claim it's one Murloc and then just get out of dodge. Three armor. It's not too bad. Mitsuhide has done some work in slowing down Karakute for now. You could just do with one Ravaging Ghoul, one Whirlwind, just getting rid of these three minions that have one, that one attack and one health. That'd be pretty beneficial. Tower Keeper's not bad, though. I think once Philippines sees a Ravaging Ghoul does not come down this turn, they can start to advance kind of thinking, okay, I know at least one thing that's not there. 
Because, yeah, Tar Creeper is probably what's going to end up coming down. Uh, if not the Acolyte of Pain, obviously yeah. there's a lot of one attack minions on the board. But a Flame Tongue Totem does punish this, so it's not the most optimal play, you would think. But there's no Flame Tongue Totem either. Neither player have exactly what they need. A Flame Tongue Totem would completely destroy Mitsuhide at the moment. One thing to note, Kara Cute has now picked up the entire combo. She's got Doppelgangster and she's got Evolve in hand. So if Mitsuhide does deal with this board, it's not going to matter because she can just come back with a board full of uh, six mana minions. Random six mana minions, but six mana minions. So Kara Cute can actually decide to just go ahead and sink the weapon into this and then one of the minions so that it doesn't get uh, three draws, it just gets two. Yeah. I think she, I think she has to. She would have been hoping for a healing totem there so she can put the the one two flame elemental in right. and have both her fire flame and the flame elemental heal back up again. Not going to trade the flame elemental in now though, just in case of some sort of sleep with the fishes sh chicanery. That's the that's the word of this cast by the way. <laughs> chicanery. All right, well the board just continuing to go wide with cheap minions. The sleep with the fishes is there. Obviously this is not the the board you want to use it on, but uh, what do you think about just coin Alley Armorsmith? You can probably just make the read there is no Flame Tongue Totem. It would have been played against the Acolyte for sure. Just just denying that one card draw. The Alley Armorsmith seems like it, it could just get a ton of armor. Yeah, I agree with you. I think it's the way to go here. I'm just trying to work out if there's anything else. Fiery War Axe can't be played with anything. So, unfortunately, that's not a good way to go. Yeah, I can't... Oh, no, you can play Fiery War Axe, coin out Tar Creeper, and then hit, hit the War Axe into the Primordial... Primordial Totem? That's not quite right. Primal Fin Totem. That's an alternative. I think I still prefer the Alley Armor Smith, though. Well, the Alley Armor Smith does actively generate you armor, and you feel like yeah. for the number of hits you're going to get... That's why I like Alley Armor Smith a little bit better, but yeah. Tar Creeper Fiery War Axe also works for me because it does deal with the Primal Fin Totem, but I feel like the Primal Fin Totem is not a priority for them because up until this point, it's, it's what, generated three Murlocs? Gonna yeah. go and clear it anyway. Sure. Enough is enough. I think that's what they would have been deciding between, though. Definitely those two plays, but decides that these resources are just gonna keep coming, and, and Mitsuhide does not want to have to waste the brawl on a board of one ones. So just stopping this board from getting too big while he can, and he's hoping that the Star Creeper eats up several of these minions, if not all of them. Looks like it could just do exactly that, unless Philippines just chooses not to attack. Yeah. Well, they're they're prepping for the doppelganger evolve turn, you would think, though. So it might just be one of the, a situation where they feel like they do have to attack some of them in. Yeah, they can't doppelganger evolve when they've already got a big board because they like they really want this board full of nothing to eat up a brawl or something. That's the dream for Philippines yeah. here. But unfortunately, it doesn't have that one missing ingredient. It doesn't have the manatee totem. It doesn't have the flame tongue totem. The one thing that would bait out the brawl it still isn't there. So she's gonna start making these trades. I think you're right. I think she may just have to go ahead and play uh, Double Gangster Evolve next turn. Aya is also another consideration next turn. Well, one thing in this situation right now, it only makes a 2-2 Jade. And then obviously upon dying, you'd make a 3-3. But because you've only played the Jade Claws up until this point, the actual Jades you're getting off Aya are a little bit weak. Yeah. Not that that's necessarily the main point of consideration, but it's certainly something that you are considering. Aya herself is an irritating shape to deal with, especially when the Furry Works has just been destroyed by the Blood Cell Corsair. Now, just putting that on the board is going to be a five attack threat, which Mitsuhide needs to find some way of getting rid of, and then some way of getting rid of something else afterwards. It doesn't even necessarily matter how big these Jade Golems are. It's still there. It's still going to be dealing some damage. We see Mitsuhide considering whether or not he even wants to swing into one of these small minions. Is unable to kill anything because they are at two health. Would generate one armor, though. And certainly the damage uh, on face at this point is just not relevant. I must choose. What are we waiting for at the moment? Just working out if he's going to make the trade or go face. There you go. I think especially with the shape that the board is in right now, I prefer the Aya. Oh, you can't... You Ricky, can't yeah, 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 you can't anyway. play that. Well, you'd only get two of them. Oh, that's you can also the trades first, I guess. One thing that's interesting is, had Mitsuhide hit one of the minions down to one health, then it could have actually traded into the Tar Creeper, and then right. Doppelgangster could have been played in full. So that might have actually been the consideration point, where it's just better. Wow. Yeah, he doesn't get the armor. He doesn't get the one armor there, but he makes sure the Doppelgangster can't be played for full value. Okay. 
Well, Philippines can just trade in the three minions into the Tar Creeper here and then play the Doppelgangster. Oh, yeah, I, I'm three attack. What it has three at? attack on your opponent. Do you know how that mechanic works? Rob? No, could you break it down for so, me? So Tar Creeper has three attack on yeah. your opponent's turn, but only one on yours. That's, That's crazy. Such great health and stuff. Yeah. That does seem like in some situations as good as Sengen Shieldmaster for one, ma one yeah. mana. Yeah, yeah. in some situations. Yeah. But yeah, gonna go with the Aya. I liked this from the beginning. I think, ah, uh, he's gonna say, I think she has to make the trades here, but still opting not to. That Tar Creeper has put a massive wall in the way for Mitsuhide. Yeah, and it's the first of many, really. Obviously, this deck just plays a bunch of taunts. Yeah, that's, that's what if it you does. You can't beat your Tar Creeper. I mean that's like that's like the first boss in any RPG. You know you gotta you gotta get past that one if you want to get the final boss. I want to think back for a second to the play you described earlier. The, what would have happened if this Tar Creeper was an Ali Armorsmith instead? Would that still be sitting there, but also dealing with a minion each turn and gaining Mitsuhide two extra armor? Yeah, it's a it's a fair point. <laughs> the fact that Karakut still hasn't picked up a Flame Tongue Totem is quite laughable, actually. No, I think. no Flame Tongue Totem, no Bloodlust, nothing to actually make use of this wide board yet. Yeah, Karakuta, I think, really did want to, to the point you were making earlier, just try to cash out on this board and try to get something brawled. Just try to get some combination of cards out of the hand of Mitsuhide, just to make sure that the, the board lightens up. But Mitsuhide just kind of making the read, like, well, there's no Bloodlust here, and even if there is a Bloodlust, it's honestly not the end of the world. Yeah. I'm going to carve up a lot of the, uh, or a decent bit of the Philippines board going through it, so... Yeah. <laughs> Paracute not, not able to draw that Brawl, and yeah. We said earlier, it's about this dance. It's about her wanting to bait out the Brawl, but not get too much of her stuff brawled. She's kind of put down everything she can possibly afford to put down into this. Like, come on, Mitsuhide. Come on, Brawl it. At least use a Ravaging Call Sleep with the Fishes. Do something. Just dropping obvious hints like, oh, look how big this board is. It would be a shame <laughs> if I had a spell that gave them all plus three attack. Like, wink, wink. <laughs> it's just not happening, though. No, so she's uh, going to go ahead and just take initiative and start clearing. Still keeps a sizable board, but this one will be able to be doppelgangstered on the next turn if she wants. Time is running out as well, because come turn eight, uh, Primordial Drake becomes an extra option that the warrior is going to have to clear the board once Mitsuhide picks it up. And it's something that Karakut's going to be thinking about. Ooh, Diahol Matriarch. Just right off the top, you killed my baby. Not a card you I'm see back. very often played from the Taunt Warrior, actually, because more often than not, it never gets drawn. Yeah. But there it is, in all of its five mana, six, nine glory. Ugh. Some stats there. Many a times I find myself trying to get aggressive, but a six, nine in my way. Yeah. Ugh. It is it is extremely powerful, obviously, but Alright, so did go ahead and put down the thing from below on the prior turn. Again, so... I just think she's doing whatever she can to bait out this brawl before she plays Doppelgangster Evolve and Yeah. Mitsuhide has no real reason to play it. As you said, he understands there's no bloodlust, there's no risk of him dying whatsoever. He can just keep putting big taunts up in the way. I will be shocked if he decides to brawl this. No, I definitely do not think you do. This This could just honestly, if you're just like, well, they don't have uh, blood loss, maybe I just play Curator. Goes in and chooses to execute the 5-5 five five there. And now just play down the Armorsmith. I mean, how much bigger do the minions actually get in this deck? Yeah. I don't mind using the Execute there whatsoever. Finally putting down the Ali Armorsmith, which Karakut is just not going to be able to get past. Yeah, Curator would have gotten in more resources there, but the 5-5 five five just kind of too dangerous to be left alive in Mitsuhide's yeah. head and lined up perfectly with being able to drop it with the Alley Armor Smith, so. And she just can't play this Doppelgangster Evolve either. She can't take the risk uh, and, and try and go for the fact that Netherlands haven't picked up a Brew yet. It's just so unlikely. They're halfway through the deck now. There must be something to deal with it. She needs to at least see one board clear before she goes all in. Yeah, the Curator doesn't actually really do anything for the Philippines here. Sanjin is always just a 4-man 3-5. Ozruk is interesting. She's played yeah. one Firefly, right? Has she played both? No, I, th I think we've only seen one Firefly so far. So, I mean, there is the potential for getting, uh, from what we can see, a 5-15 Ozruk, but against a warrior, that doesn't really mean a whole lot. Yeah. yeah. Plus, you have to wait until you actually get the Firefly. Goes with the Curator just for pure stats, it looks like, but you're right, I can't think of a single beast or dragon or Murloc that these Shaman are running. There's also the potential for Curator Evolve. You get an eight mana minion. That's not bad. Yeah. 
could just actually be something she does on the next turn. Mitsuhide just turtling through this game. Gonna drop his the curator because he's got no need to drop anything bigger than that. Picks up the primordial drake. Karakute will know that it's in the hand now because quest warriors aren't running any other dragon at the moment. Well, you see, in some decks you see like an occasional deathwing. But sure, yeah. sure. Most of the time, yeah, it's gonna that, be primordial drake. That was a lot more popular, I believe, in the past. I haven't seen deathwing in quest warrior recently. I saw it once recently, but okay, yeah. I mean, they have so many board sweeps anyway that a lot of times Deathwing yeah. is just, you don't need it. Even with the cool new animation. That does make you want to play it more, though, doesn't it? Well, if you're if you're someone who is casual, like we are, then yeah. <laughs> uh, but for people trying to compete for, you know, well, they ride for their country. They, you're saying they don't put cards in the decks because of the animation? I'm saying some people don't. Lorinda probably never does. Nah, probably yeah. not. <laughs> if Lorinda could play with animations off, you know he would. All these players playing with no sound. I don't know. All right, so board's still fairly wide here. The Jade Lightning comes out, and it is boosted. But unfortunately, both these minions are at six health. Yep, not a single draw as we expected. Kind of just leaving it up. You know, Kara Keats like, look at this 4-6. You probably want to brawl. It's big. <laughs> this could be a problem. And unfortunately, realistically, Mitsuhide probably does not want to brawl this. In fact, um, Primordial Drake will clear almost everything. Put the Ali Armorsmith into the Stonehill Defender. Put the Curator into the Curator. Drake only leaves up a 3-1 uh, Jade Golem. What now? That might not even be necessary yet. Mitsuhide is just so chilled out in this game. Yeah, he is, he is really uh, just trying to get as much value out of these cards as possible. Yeah, again, just understand that Bloodlust is not there. There is so much more of a limited range on what the Philippines can actually do. Yeah. Ravaging Ghoul plus Sleep with the Fishes, also an option, but just not in any hurry to do anything. I don't even mind just dropping both taunts here. Like, uh, I was going to say Bloodhoof Brave and the Diamond Matriarch. But okay, gonna go with the player described earlier. Why not? Keep a keep a shaman's board clear, and they can't do anything. I guess this plays around the potential of Karaku picking up Flame Tongue Totem as well. It's not like the shaman is drawing a lot of cards. It's frankly the weakness of the class. Mm. Is it basically just has Mana Tide Totem at the moment that is uh, seeing play? But yeah, playing around the potential for the Bloodlust off the top or potentially the Flame Tongue Totem yeah, definitely doesn't bother me. Now, what does Karaki do about this? Jade Lightning, we're on, what, 4-4 Jade Golem, I think? Is it maybe just time to pull the trigger? You want a double gangster evolve? I don't I don't want to, for the record. You're you're <laughs> 17 cards into the Warrior's deck. And you've not seen a single Brawl yet, right. or a Ravaging Ghoul, or a Sleep with the Fishes. Yeah, it, it certainly feels pretty bad, but at some point, it's kind of a situation where if you let them draw more, that percentage only gets higher that they have it. Unfortunately, Karaki has no way of playing around the Brawl anymore, though. Like, she, she's got no way of baiting it out, that's for certain. Right. How does she ever develop a board again without playing Doppelgangster Evolve? Gonna go for it. Yeah, I mean, uh, to your point now, the minions on board just actually check what's going on, so... Okay, <laughs> I mean, these are... There are some big minions here, that's the good news. The bad news is that the Beast is only going to help Mitsuhide out after the Brawl gets played. Well, do you... Unless it wins. I'm looking at this, like, do you actually feel you have to brawl here? Is there any reason not to now? You've I mean, got... you could Ravaging Ghoul, Ravaging Ghoul, Sleep with the Fishes, which doesn't deal with the two big minions. I mean, maybe yeah. I just have to brawl. Maybe that's just easier. Go ahead and collect your complimentary 3-3 three, three most of the time. I just don't think there's any any reason not to, because Karakut's only going to have five cards in hand next turn. Yeah, and you have the you have the double Ravaging Ghoul, you have the Sleep with the Fishes, I think, you I have think good reload. They know one of these cards is Patches, because one of the Blood Cell Corsairs was played earlier to destroy right. Fiery War X. Um, you're go going to have ways of dealing with smaller boards later. I just don't think there's any reason to hold on to Brawl anymore. I mean, the reason would just be that you're being a little greedier, just waiting to see a little bit more which has thus far kind of lined up with what we've seen from Mitsuhide, but yeah, this is fine. Trading in to the Cubell Crystal Runner just to make Ooh. sure that if it survives, you can Ravaging Ghoul it away, but worst minion has survived. Now Diahorn Matriarch gonna try and compete. Look how happy Philippines looked about that brawl. <laughs> oh, Bloodlust, come on. There it is. You're late. They run it. 
Yeah. At least we know they run it now. Why? Well, I, I never. This is not like the Nazoth <laughs> game yesterday where we were like, oh, maybe they don't run it. We knew that Bloodlust was a thing. Kind of different. Yeah. So the beast's going to make short work of that dinosaur. Healing Totem would have actually just been a little bit better. Yeah. We played it, around just the potential for Ravaging Ghoul. It would have meant that Mitsuhide had to play two of these three cards that, that clear the board. And, and if, if he played both Ravaging Ghouls, then there's nothing to proc the Sleep with the Fishes later. So that actually may have brought Karakut back into this game. But unfortunately, she's going to have to work a lot harder to win this one. Quest is also almost complete for Mitsuhide there. One more taunt. And we do see a taunt in hand. Sulfurus could be coming down sooner rather than later. Not that Sulfurus is great in this matchup. Yeah, it certainly suffers against a class that can just routinely generate a minion off the hero power, and yep. a lot of the cards in the deck make multiple minions, or at least a few of them, so certainly a little bit less good. But realistically, if you have the opportunity to spend two mana to randomly just throw eight damage fireballs around, certainly very powerful no matter what you're facing. It's here they just gonna have a little chuckle, I imagine. Thinks that one one Mur if Karakut thinks that one one Murloc is going to scare him, she's got another thing coming. I mean, it's got a stick. Yeah, that is a that is a rowdy looking Murloc. That's a good point. I wouldn't want it near me. I just want to like join up with him, you know, just terrorize. You want to get a stick as well? Zones, yeah. I'm not allowed to have a stick at Blizzard. They don't, don't let me have one. Oh, yeah. That sucks. Yeah. It's a lack of trust, really. <laughs> All right, so the Ravaging Ghoul, as we mentioned, is going to go ahead and come down here. I've been inside that thing for months. <laughs> I don't know why that tickles me. I, I mean, you, just, you never hear it. Yeah, yeah. You never, you never actually hear uh, Finkel Einhorn's play sound. But that is quest complete. Not enough mana to actually play it and use the hero power, but can use Sulfurs to at least start tidying up the board a little bit and... Uh, Mitsuhide pretty firmly has the board from this point on. Do you on. want to put Sephiroth into a 0-1 Taunt Totem? Guess I mean, not. I don't think you do. <laughs> Double J Lightning is actually a way to get back onto this board as well for Karakute. That's gonna th They would summon a 4-4 and a 5-5, whilst also maybe dealing with both of these 3-3s. Three That's not bad. Yeah, and honestly, if the hero power wasn't online uh, for the quest, then they could actually be, actually be pretty threatening. Sadly, though, the hero power is online. And the Ravaging Ghoul can just come down, sweep up the two totems. Yeah. Activate the Bloodhoof Brave, too, so being able to put a little bit of pressure. If Kara Cute had one more reset in her hand, never mind, it wouldn't matter. Her pool just got picked up off the top. Okay. Well, it's a day's 20 cards into the deck now. I was going to say, if Kara Cute just had, you know, one more Doppelgangster Evolve combo ready to go, then maybe, maybe she could come back onto this board after this all gets dealt with, but no. Not with another Brawl. This game looks about as over as it can be now. Well, I'm sure once the board gets cleared up, then we'll say yeah. it's as over as it could be, but yeah. Good sleep with the fishes there, but you take a little friendly fire on your own Bloodhoof Brave. Would survive though, and then you could make sure that you 100% clear the board and guarantee the hero power goes face. Yeah. Do you even want the hero power to go face? Why well, you? I'm just Unless the Philippines actually just concedes, which they might, because this is obviously just a very bad situation. I'm just wondering if you if you are going to take the sleep with the fishes line, you can then hero power hit the uh, minion with that, keep your bloody brave alive. I don't think it matters either way. Hitting it with Sulfurus works too. Yep. And just go ahead and guarantee a Tar Creeper comes down because, well, why not? <laughs> Get back onto this board, Kara Cute. There's the Evolve! Just one missing piece. What can Patches, Blood Cell Corsair, and a Totem be evolved into? Three Doomsayers? Three Doomsayers. Yeah. Yep. It's not going to do it, though, is it? Pull the lever, three Doom or Doomsayers come down. Yeah. <laughs> we going for it? Let's go for it. Ooh, it turns out he's not going to be in charge on this board. <laughs> nope. Patches, not even a little bit. Patches nor Karakute in charge of anything here. They can be in charge of the concede button. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. They get something. So Karakute's actually considering the bloodlust here by the looks of it. That would allow Patches to trade into Bloodhoof Brave, but that's all. 
Chalk in the background there looks like he's a. Uh, he's definitely just taking a breather. Sure, he can see this game's over. <laughs> uh, tagging it over, you know, Bloodlust would get rid of one of the minions, so that's fine. Yeah, I'll make make the Netherlands work for it. Gonna go ahead and just save the evolve for the the board that's coming someday. Yeah, well, at the moment, Netherlands don't actually have a way of guaranteeing that that hero power goes face. That may just go into a totem. Just gonna take the hide gun, sure. Why not? You can play it. Fits the curve. Wouldn't have crazed worshiper also fit the curve though. It would have done. Yeah. Huh. I guess I just want to put down the the Harrison just to guarantee more pressure. Sure. Unfortunately for Philippines, it all matters very little here. Um, Although the series itself matters a fair bit, again, as we've mentioned. Yeah. Only three games in Stage 2. Manatai Totem would have certainly been great earlier on. There is a point early in the game against the Warrior where the Manatai Totem uh, can very reasonably get a couple turns worth of value if the Fiery War Axe is not used. Look at the spell damage. <laughs> it's not going to do anything, though. Uh, we see Philippines in high spirits, though. Uh, they lost to the team that emerged from Stage 1 with the best record overall, so certainly no shame in that. But, you know, Netherlands, th there's no shame in losing to Netherlands at all, yep. as you're saying. Like, um, Mitsuhide and Theo actually both competed in DreamHack last weekend. This is something I wanted to bring up, because um, neither of them quite got top 16, but uh, Theo finished 20th place. And Mitsuhide finished in 19th place. So wow. right yeah. next to each other there, almost getting top 16 in the Swiss. But um, there you go. Netherlands are going to take this. No need to go to the ace match this game. Yeah, we talked about how uh, the Netherlands likes to to mess with the their deck rosters and their lineups to be unpredictable. They played Warrior only once in all of Stage One. <laughs> yeah, they, yeah, which is crazy to me because Warrior was the most picked yeah. class well, there's, uh, there's, amongst the rest of Stage One, the 24 teams that advance at least. There's so. something that they know then that they're not telling everyone else. Yeah, I, I asked uh, I asked Tyson. He didn't want to necessarily give up any strats, much like Ukraine didn't want to with the the Warlock pick. So, but yeah, uh, early win for the Netherlands. And I think when you're watching the Netherlands play against. The Philippines, what you want to see as a fan of the Netherlands is consistency, and you want to see them come out and just get the win there. Yep. Uh, I feel like the, the matches were nav well navigated by uh, the Netherlands, so that's, that's basically just what you want to see as a fan. It's funny when you ask these, these big famous streamers these questions, and they say they don't want to give away their strategies, because you kind of expect them to just be open about everything, but no, they keep their things close to their chest. It's important to them that they win. Right, we're going to have a chat with one of the players from the Netherlands. Hey, Tice, how's it going? Hello, doing good, of course. Come on, we just won. Congratulations <laughs> for defeating Philippines. Um, I want to ask if there's anyone in your group that you are particularly afraid of, or if you think it's just going to be a clean sweep to top 16. Uh, well, even I'm uh, confident we can make that clean sweep. You should never count out uh, Korea, right, in, uh, in any game. So we, of course, look forward to that game too. But uh, yeah, we are off with a great start. Yeah, so uh, you... I talked to you a little bit earlier, and I, I asked if there was anything you wanted to say to the fans mm -hmm. uh, from the Netherlands, and I have no idea what you actually <laughs> wrote. Uh, I don't want to mispronounce it. Hup, Holland, hup. Okay. That's my, that, that's my message, yeah. Uh, what, is, uh, what does that mean? It's, uh, it's just Dutch cheering, like uh, saying, come on, Netherlands, come on, something like that. Oh, cool, yeah. Um, yeah. Now, you said that you think it's going to be a pr pretty clean sweep now to get into top 16. Um, do, you, do you believe that that you actually have to win anymore? Or do you think this, this one win is enough for you to get through? Do you think it's important that you win the next two games as well? Uh, we definitely want to just win one more. I think with if you are having two wins, there is no way you're not going to make it. And we don't want to rely on tiebreakers. We don't want to rely on anything. So we will for sure go into the next match just to just, uh, take the victory and do it on ourselves. Right. Well, good luck to you next mm -hmm. week, Tice. We'll see you later. Have a great day. Same. Thank you. Very confident team. It is, it is Hup Holland Hup. Hup Holland Hup. Okay. Well, yeah. We've all learned something today. Hey, we're here for Hearthstone, but also to learn about other cultures. See how it all went down, though. Tyler played the Quest Rogue really, really masterfully, uh, going up and taking a, a game off of a class that, that really has a favorable matchup against it. Yeah. We were saying this right at the start. Um, Druid had, had a really... Uh, 
Had a really good shot here, but unfortunately he's just his cards came in the wrong order. The Savage Royals came after the board had been cleared. There was no real snowball-y start, and unfortunately for him, yeah, Questro got the unfavored matchup. This time though, Chalk on the Warrior, this aggressive deck did do its job, and it did it very quickly. Even though one of its minions uh, just decided he didn't want to play ball. <laughs> right, yeah, they are queued up with a, a fairly greedy control-oriented paladin. It just ended up panning out. That's where the Pirate Warrior shines. Obviously, we saw a bit of it yesterday. Hey, we barely had a chance to even look at Theo's hand this game because everything was was all down to the... To the uh, not I almost said Control Warrior. Everything was all down to the Pirate Warrior there. Spellbreaker finishing the job. There was no way he was losing that, even with some reluctant minions there. Never seen a pirate show Mercy before. <laughs> Ha-ha! I do things my way. All right, well, well yeah, these Greater Arcane Missiles, this, <laughs> they 100% they changed up the flavor of the game. Once Ty saw that damage come in, realized he had a two-turn lethal set up, uh, at least, or two-turn pop the block, and he just went from it for there. Just entirely too much pressure coming out from Tice in this one. Yeah, just able to get there despite the fact that Staz had that Eater of Secrets for a shortcut to the victory. He managed to play the defense of Alex Strauss. It just wasn't enough. Tice got the damage very early on. And yeah, I just noticed, by the way, that Spellbender never, ever procced. Well, yeah, again, the Freeze Mage had so few minions. Again, it could have done. If 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 Tice is one of those great arcane missiles missed, maybe Tice would have then had to try and deal with the Alex Strauss. Maybe yeah. played the Meteor. Meteor would have missed, hit the Spellbender, only dealt three damage to the Alex Strauss. Things would have been very different, I feel, if those arcane missiles missed. Yeah. Meanwhile, in this one, we just saw Mitsuhide playing uh, really conservatively, just making the most of his resources, didn't panic and brawl, basically sniffed out that there was no bloodlust, and just continued to force Kara to uh, be in situations where she couldn't actually force the offensive. And there you go. Game number one of today comes to a, uh, a pretty firm conclusion. Not quite a 3-0, but uh, close enough. Let's take one last look at Group C. All right, so Group C, we've yet to see Argentina and South Korea play. That'll actually be tomorrow on the North American Hearthstone Global Games broadcast. But yeah, I, I spoke to uh, some of the other teams in the, not necessarily in this group, but around the Global Games, but they're really expecting Netherlands and South Korea to make it out. And I'm sure Argentina and the Philippines are going to have something to say about that. Try to change that up. Yep, Philippines going to want to work really hard to get back into it. But Thais himself said that they're afraid of South Korea. Uh, We're going to go to a short break, but next up it's going to be Czech Republic versus Israel. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. We're almost there. Quiet down, everyone. This is not like any of our previous expeditions. This will be far more ambitious. We're stepping into a land of primordial wonder. Infused with astonishing elemental energies. Plant life here holds very unusual properties. So don't touch anything. And while you may be excited to see the local fauna, you might want to make sure they don't see you. Because their powers of adaptation are devastating. Make no mistake, we will be tested at every turn. But if we stay on our guard, we might just survive. Now then, are you ready? Then let's journey into Ongoro Crater. 